Business as Unusual is a thought-provoking podcast that explores the innovative strategies, disruptive ideas, and unconventional practices driving successful leaders and companies in the ever-evolving world of modern business. Subscribe, comment, and share for weekly inspiration with our host, Aisila. Hello, welcome to Business as Unusual. Today I'm with Ashley Koshins, owner and operator of Koshins Consulting. Welcome, Ashley. Hi. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for making time to talk to us. Likewise. Before we get into the nitty gritty of Koshins Consulting, what's the last artist you got lost in? Mm, this is a good question. I actually, right now, I'm sitting at my co-working space. It's called Converge in Denver, if people are curious, but it's a collective of artists that work on pieces together or just independently, but prefer to have a group of spaces. And Phil, the guy that is shares the cubicle across from me, he has this like really intricate fabric piece that he's working on where he's used computer models like algorithms or the genetic sequence of COVID to then digitize what that would look like in fabric and make quilts out of it. So I just got so lost talking to him and what it looks like to see some of those things that feel very abstract as a very textile thing in front of you that you can touch and hold. So that was really cool. I have to ask, if you're at a co-working space in Denver that is about visual art, do you do visual art? I paint. I consider myself a hobbyist more than a professional artist, which the folks in this community have been supportive in helping me break that unhelpful thought pattern. But I consider myself a creative individual that every once in a while dabbles with oil paints. That's where I'm at right now. Talk to me in three years. Maybe, maybe I'll have owned the phrase artist, but not yet. What got you into painting? Trauma. <laughs> is the, is I'm the sorry. Uh, oh, I think that it was a really, I always used to dabble with paints as a kid, but I think as an adult, I just, I needed to process some things that happened to me and I needed to take the experiences that I felt inside and get rid of them in a way that was creative and reconstructive but also external. And that was painting. And so I went through a period of unemployment after an assault and just had the time to, to sit there and paint it out. It sounds really powerful. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for asking. So Koshin's Consulting, tell us a little bit about what you're up to with that. Yeah, to transition all the way over to yeah. the left brain. <laughs> <laughs> Koshans Consulting was in direct response to the pandemic. I previously did marketing work for Amazon merchants, which I knew was very commercial and not in line with my values necessarily. But I had transitioned over or planned to transition over to the nonprofit sector in March of 2020, which if you remember what was happening in March of 2020, it was probably the worst time to pick a new job. And so... In the interim waiting for that job, which was eventually rescinded, I founded a consultancy and I reached out to people that I knew needed my work or people reached out to me when they knew I was available. And soon it became easier to find a new client than it did a new job. But did you find it easier then to found the consultancy then, or was it just more rewarding or is it the right shift you didn't want to having made that choice to move into that different sector to go back to where you had been all of it yeah. something else completely yeah all of those things feel true there were I founding a business is not easy that's the first thing I want to say um and in 2020 looking for work wasn't easy either but I immediately found such rewarding results from working with clients that I got to pick and that I knew were working with me because of my work and not because of the fact that I was contractually obligated to be there and so that took off and it took probably I'd say eight six to eight months for me to transition out of the mindset of I'm a freelancer that's just doing this during the pandemic 
to, I'm a business owner and I've created a consultancy that serves my clients' needs. I can hear that, that sometimes I, when I step into something new that I have ideas about, I can feel a little like I'm play acting or, Mm. and I know they talk about imposter syndrome, but I'm not really talking about that so much as integrating the reality of the experience of doing something like owning a business versus your idea about what that is and how does that meet in your expression and experience? Yeah. And I think how does it show up in your expression is, is the reason why I just needed to have that come to Jesus moment is I was making all these decisions about my pricing or the packages that I did or did not want to spend my own unbillable time to set up. And when I was making those decisions from the point of view of someone that it was in it part-time only for the limited future, it, it was difficult. But when I transitioned into, no, this is my career in my business, it became suddenly very easy to invest more to get more. That makes sense. So this is business as unusual. What do you feel is unusual about what you're doing? (laughs) So many things. I work with nonprofits and mission-driven organizations. I do digital marketing and search engine optimization work for those clients. So search engine optimization, also known as SEO, is website optimization. I take websites and make them more responsive or better to read or more usable, especially in terms of the way they show up in Google. Um, And so those two things, the audience group that I work with of nonprofits and highly technical digital marketing seem to be antithetical, but it's so important that they're not because this group of really heart-driven individuals that want to take their cause and amplify it across bigger audiences need the technicality of digital marketing so badly, although they may not have the skills or the resources to access some of the marketing automations or just high skill level things that I do on a day-to-day basis. So what's unusual about my business is I truly bridge that gap between heart-centered people and the data-driven methods that they need to succeed. I feel like I run into a lot of folks who have ideas about what marketing is and it keeps them from actually putting out their work in a way that helps people to find them. It's really about letting people know what you're up to so that the folks that need you or want you can find you. Absolutely. One of the questions that I've seen come up in different marketing spaces recently is the ways in which the privacy awareness of the sort of in public sector and the ways that they're changing how cookies work and those kinds of things are going to affect the way that marketers strategize. Is that something that you've have any sort of thoughts about that you want to share? Yeah, absolutely. I think that I'm so glad, first of all, that governments are starting to pay attention to this because for so long, internet marketing was the wild west where big companies made the rules and made choices with people's data that not only did we not consent to, but most people didn't understand enough to consent or not consent to it. Governments are stepping in and the way that has showed up in in my business is with the transition from Google Analytics, Universal Analytics is what it's called, to Google Analytics 4. Sharing, sparing you the technical details, what that means is that the way that Google was tracking website data and the user data that got recorded and what we know about the pages that get loaded and how long users stay on that All of that is changing in order to support more stringent privacy laws. So the interface is totally different. And as somebody that uses a lot of those metrics to make daily decisions for clients, it's a constant adaptation process. And it's a thorn in my side, frankly. But for the greater societal benefit, I am happy that Companies like Google that have so much data are starting to be more responsible with it, and (laughs) it's a transition. I'm curious to see how it will play out. I I started using the internet long enough ago that I've seen several iterations, and the I was very naive. I had a a friend of mine calls it being nerd sighted. I think that's Mm -hmm. a really great way to put it. I was very enthusiastic about the possibilities and the opportunities. And I trusted my geeky friends. And then realizing the ways in which the data was being 
manipulated or used in ways that I felt did not match my utopian view of the internet. It made me realize, oh, okay, this is not, it, it's not the same when it goes from that like small group of committed utopian nerd sided people to a larger yeah. corporate interest. And I think it's great. I think the internet has a lot of really powerful positives to it. And I agree with you that while it's the transition is probably going to be a bit of a pain, that the end result of people having a lot more control over their information is going to be for the better. Yeah, I agree. So who do you typically work with or who would you say thrives with the service you provide? Nonprofits and mission-driven organizations that have an internal marketing team but they lack the training or experience in search engine optimization and other marketing automation tactics. I've worked with some very small nonprofits between one to two people. And that I love that work because the people in it are so passionate, but it's hard for them to implement some of the suggestions and recommendations that I make to improve their marketing because they just don't have the bandwidth. What do you do in that case? Do you, is it a client that you refer to someone else or do you encourage them to bring someone in to to implement? Yeah, a little of both depending on the individual client's needs. I have done, uh, I split up the way that I work with people in three basic categories. The first is manage where I do everything for you. The second is advise where I tell you what to do. And the third is teach where I know how to sustain what I've done for them. And so the smaller nonprofits get to pick which of those buckets that they want. And I'm really, as a business owner, starting to think, should I charge people to teach them how to do it if I then acknowledge that three months down the line, they're not going to do it? Like, I I don't know. I really struggle with that. Can I make decisions for people or should I let them choose? But that's a long-winded way of saying that normally I'll let them choose I tend to edge people in that camp of really low resources into the manage bucket. So if I can manage all of their SEO for them, that leads to better results. Yeah. I mean, it's something I've noticed and I'm sure people listening already know this, but I'll say it for the one person that might need to hear it, which is that experience and practice does make you typically a little bit out quicker to get to those more useful activities and decisions. So I'm guessing if you manage it, it probably not only takes less of their time, but it probably takes less time overall to Mm. to that optimal result. Absolutely. That's a really long way of saying, if you need that help, talk to Ashley. What's a typical problem you solve? I feel like you've already answered this in a certain way, but if you have any kinds of examples or thoughts around that you think would make it a little more concrete for people, I'd love to hear that. The biggest and most tangible thing that I do is bring more visitors to somebody's website. I do that in lots of ways. A huge way that I work with nonprofits is creating marketing automations behind the scenes using email marketing software to try to drive traffic to the site in ways that are automated and don't have to take staff members' time. I also use search engine optimization tools to just change the type of content that you're writing and the way that it's written to attract more eyes via Google or anybody else that's searching on other search engines. But that's really what it's about, just getting more eyeballs to your website. Do you also work with them on conversion or is that something that you have someone else take up? Yeah, that's a great question. And conversion rate optimization is always part of the picture. Like it's not going to serve anyone anything if I drive a bunch of traffic to a bad web page. Ideally, that web page should have a really great call to action, but that does require that the organization is clear on what their digital marketing goals are. Mm -hmm. If they've got like a white paper or other notable asset that they really want people to access for free and it has their organization's name on it, like that's clear and straightforward. I can drive more traffic to your white paper. But some organizations I work long and hard just to even to I even identify what their digital marketing goals might be. Whether it's a nonprofit or a for-profit business, the clarity piece is it's so easy to get distracted by mm-hmm. what you think things are supposed to be or to feel like you know in your heart without necessarily having articulated it in a way that's externally understandable. Yeah. 
And that's, and so that can be a really important part of the, the process is to get that clarity with, with those goals, because then you can be more, I think, effective in all the rest of it. Yeah. Then we're actually tracking conversions that matter. Well, what's the best advice you have received or given or both? It doesn't have to be work related, but it can be. I think of something that another business owner in Denver told me recently. She owns a social media marketing company. And I came to her some for some advice when I was considering hiring an intern. Because I have a group of subcontractors now and other partners that I work with. But I really wanted to bring somebody in more full time. And she said, don't start to onboard new talent before you've onboarded experienced talent. And that process of working with people or onboard, growing your team every other, like first you need an advanced professional and then you can bring a growing professional on. That's guided the way I think about growing my team because I was so tempted to just hire cheap talent that I'm glad she gave me the advice that wouldn't serve me in the long run because it wouldn't take any work off of my plate. You need people who have, if not the same level of experience, enough experience to be able to work independently. Yep. Because if you need folks to help with the work, obviously you have to train them in your way or make sure they fit your values or whatnot, but then to be able to say hands off. And also some people want to be micromanaged, but most people find it irritating. (laughs) What do you do to keep yourself inspired when it gets hard to believe in your dreams? How do you recharge? I have been getting better in the last year about taking integration time in another side. We've talked about so many of my side hustles already, but another one of the (laughs) things that I spend time on is teaching yoga. And until when I was just a yoga student and not a yoga teacher, Shavasana at the end felt like the, the throwaway piece of, it didn't seem valuable. Like it wasn't any big and bold poses. It was just a nice little nap at the end of class and learning about the science of the way that the body and the mind absorb new information. Those moments of integration and space are critical. And so I've, been building in more shavasanas into my work life where it's Mm. like just don't set an intention and a goal for something you might need to think about on the back burner and let it be on the back burner until you come back fresh at the end of the weekend I think that's the hardest part about being self-employed and or really being passionate about your work is letting yourself take a little bit of a pause when I first started working in the nonprofit world, I wouldn't take breaks if I was, I was there all day. Cause I was like, people donated to, to have me be here. Can't waste a single moment of their money. <laughs> and I found that I was maybe not as effective, definitely cranky because that might mean I didn't eat for nine hours. And I, and so I was like, maybe I should take some breaks. They should follow the legal rules every four hours or whatever. Oh my gosh. I was suddenly like, Oh, okay. I get it now. <laughs> like sometimes breaks are, um, Actually, sometimes it's the wrong word. Breaks are critical. We need that space to let our whole being, like you said, integrate. And there's that back processing thing. It's magical, but it's real. (laughs) It's just the way that our human form is created is like we have never processed this much rapidly as we're expected to process it in the modern world. Like the course of information moved so much more slowly through our evolution that we owe ourselves just from an evolutionary perspective, moments of pause. Now that makes a lot of sense. So what, obviously with marketing, you want to amplify and raise up the organizations you work with so they can meet their mission in a larger sense. What do you see as the impact of doing this work? Yeah, I, There's so many thoughts just happened. Biggest (laughs) impact for my clients is definitely their end users. If they get to talk to more participants in their programs or connect with more donors or whatever it is that they're in direct service to is somehow amplified by my work, that's a huge win. I think the secondary win that I feel more succinctly is the work that I take off of individual employees' plates. 
in you highlighted so well about the burnout that nonprofit folks experience. And if I can just take two things off of their plate, either by me doing them or by teaching them how to manage the automation that'll do it for them, I think that they'll go so much further for longer. And I care deeply about the social justice, wellness, and 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 all of the causes we're working on. I don't folks that do that work burn out. Yeah. It's something I was actually talking with a, another guest about that there's this poverty mentality and scarcity mentality yeah. that we have cultivated, in my opinion, in the nonprofit world. It's like artists where it's the idea that because you love what you're doing, you should be willing to do it for free, which honestly, to a certain extent, I think a lot of people would if it didn't mean that they would be homeless and not eat. If, if we had a social safety net or something that allowed people to simply give their time away, I think a lot of people would. There's a lot of people really motivated by contribution. However, we don't live in a world where that's what we can use to pay our bills. I can't, be, yeah. I can't give you my contribution to pay my mortgage. I need to give you a certain amount of dollars. I think for the people that I've seen in the nonprofit world that have that passion, they end up in that sort of awkward place of feeling almost badly to get paid to do something that they believe so deeply in. And it, there's also, I feel like a lot of folks who feel like myself included at times, I'll cop to that, it, that if it's not, painful. It's not really work. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of things that I love and I, some of them are work that I get paid for, but many of them are actually work. It's just that because I love them, I don't think of it that way. It has to hurt. <laughs> I think that's the, like some of the burnout stuff comes from these like very strong cultural narratives. Yeah. I was working with a newly hired associate at who had just been given like a bunch of mundane tasks on her to-do list. And we were going through how to manage those as I was giving her another task for her to do. And I remember looking at her because she had said that she didn't push back on the person that gave her all of these things to do. And I was like, your time matters though. Your mm -hmm. time is valuable. And her eyes got big. Like she had never heard anybody say that to her before. And moments like that make me continue doing the work that I'm doing with the organizations I choose to do it with. Yeah, no, it's a, I think it's important. I think a lot of times we perpetuate problems because we aren't conscious of them. So for folks that are listening and are interested in learning more or hiring you or following you, how do they do that? My website is the best place to get in touch. It's koshansconsulting.com. I also am not just looking for clients, even though more customers is always a good thing. I'm also looking for partners and people who are willing to work with me too. So if my values sounded like they're in line with your values about work, then reach out because I'm sure I've got some place where your skill set could be valuable. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking your time to chat with me today. And I hope that folks connect with you. Likewise. Thank you so much. Thank you.